embracing patriarchy or dismantling it? What is to be learned from women-led movements for human rights and justice over their many generations and iterations? For one thing, resistance, just like revisioning, has to be creative. Today we'll go to Detroit with Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin of the hit series Grace and Frankie. They've been campaigning with restaurant workers to end abuse and win a fair wage. But first, I'll sit down with Eve Ensler of the Vagina Monologues, whose powerful new play, In the Body of the World, will bring health activists and peacemakers from all around the world to the Broadway stage when it opens at the Manhattan Theatre Club in February. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. patriarchy look like? How about post-colonialist white capitalist patriarchy? What does that look like? As V-Day, the movement launched by her hit play, The Vagina Monologue, celebrates 20 years, Tony Award-winning author, activist, and actress Eve Ensler has a few ideas. She's about to return to Broadway, starring in an adaptation of her extraordinary memoir, In the Body of the World, which tells the story of her journey back from what could have been a fatal diagnosis thanks to her relationship to struggle and with women coming back from war and genocidal violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Directed by Diane Paulos, I had a chance to see this American Repertory Theatre production last year. It will change lives. And along with the play will come 21 post-show discussions with activists, artists, doctors, nurses, survivors of all, of all sorts. It's just part of what Eve does. Eve is a longtime friend of my own and friend of this program. Eve, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So how are you feeling in your body? First start, let's start with your body. How are you feeling? I feel good in my body. I feel really good in my body. I think um, building up to the play, I've been in massive training because it's going to be uh, a marathon. Yeah, no kidding. You know? So I feel good in my body. Um, and the world? That's another story. Um, <laughs> These are, these are really deeply, deeply yeah. troubling times and uh, dark times. And I think certainly in my lifetime, um, it hasn't been this terrible. Yeah. But as I, 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 I think we talk about all the time, there's something about the kind of veil falling off yeah. and things being revealed as they are. It's, it's undeniable now. The yeah. system's broke. The government's broke. It has no relationship to the people anymore, as yeah, far as I can tell. I, I was on with Richard Wolf on his show, which is focused on capitalism. I was thinking one of the things capitalism does is create a society of alienation, mm -hmm. alienation from ourselves, from each other, from our work, etc. And we're kind of breaking out of alienation, maybe, in lots of ways. Well, I think everything is so incredibly alienating right now that you have to go to the polar opposite, yeah. which is, I think we're realizing how much we need each other and how much we're going to have to do together if we're going to actually rebuild what is broken. So let's start with the play, because I don't want to, we've got so much to talk about, but I don't want to undercut how important I think this play will be for audiences in New York. The book was super special. The play that I saw in, in its production in Boston was in Cambridge was amazing. You're bringing it here with a message that really is about connection as salvation, for, for lack of a better word. For, well, I think it's really incredible that it's happening at this moment. Um, I, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of blowing my mind in a way. Um, you know, when, when I initially wrote the play or the book seven years ago, there's a line: "Things not to think about on day four of chemo," okay. and Donald Trump was the first thing I said, and that was seven years ago. I mean, that's how, that's how long I've been fighting Donald Trump, you know, <laughs> uh, or, or the predator in chief, as I'd like to say, yeah. but. Um, but I think one of the things that's exciting to me about doing the play right now is I think we're looking at uh, an incredible rise right now in women obviously breaking the silence and speaking out and standing up against sexual harassment and abuse in all forms. And I think for me as a survivor, one of the things that happened to me at an early age was that I left my body because when you're raped or when you're beaten or when you're violated or when you're abused, women and men leave their bodies right. because it's the landscape of terror and fear and dread. And 
I think this play is really about leaving one's body and what are the consequences of that. When we, when we don't live inside our bodies, we don't live inside our own experience, we don't live inside our own feeling, we don't live inside our own reality. And so we're disassociated. Mm -hmm. we're, we're disassociated from the pain around us, from the world around us, and a lot gets to happen in our name when we're disassociated. And I think one of the exciting things is about theater, at any rate, is theater is ritual. Theater is ritual. It, it, it's a way of, of being together with 300 people every night who are apparently strangers, but midway something begins to happen in the alchemy of the room where you come into a sacred space which has a potential to actually alter your body and alter your experience. And I think if I've learned anything, it's the one thing we can trust is our experience. The play and the book are also about your connection both to struggle and specifically to the women of the Congo and how that connection helped bring you around. Now, without wanting to spoil anything of the narrative, um, just describe for people a little bit that part of this story because it's really important. Well, about nine years ago, I was invited to the Democratic Republic of Congo by Dr. Denis Mukwege, an extraordinary man and a, a Congolese gynecologist who was at that point um, under siege with the number of women who were being raped. I mean, he was literally, you know, a line from the show, he was literally sewing up the vaginas of rape survivors as fast as militias were tearing them apart. And he invited me to come because I had interviewed him at NYU. And I think he was really searching for a way to find somebody who understood vaginas and was not afraid to talk about vaginas because he was speaking out in a country that was making him sound like he was insane. And I think going to the Congo, I mean, obviously I've been in many war zones, I've been in many countries where women have been raped during wars and raped during conflicts, raped during everyday lives. But the Congo was something else. The Congo was this kind of horror of synergy yeah. where racism, colonialism, sexism, and capitalism were this fiery cauldron of destruction. And, you know, for 14 years, the Congo has been pillaged, invaded, occupied by multinationals for minerals. And that, that plunging, that plummaging, the pillaging of resources, particularly coltane, which goes into our computers and iPhones, has been on the backs of women and their bodies. Because what, the, what, what soldiers are trained in is rape. They go into the communities, they rape the women. They destroy the families. They have husbands rape you know, their daughters. They have sons rape their mothers. They break down the communities, and they take over the mines. So all of this was there. And I have to say, the number of women who have been raped and are being raped in the Congo, the level of atrocities, the stories, the, the kind of mind-blowing violence that's being done in the name of this corporate capitalism, was just, it, it, it was kind of, it was shattering. Mm. We spent weeks and weeks talking to women, interviewing women, asking them what they wanted. And, and all of them said, we need a place that's our place, where we can heal, where we can become leaders. And so we were in the process of building City of Joy when I got do diagnosed with stage four cancer. And um, it was the kind of combination of those two things that really sent me into this deep, deep process of both um, physical uprooting and this incredible process of transformation um, and where I really did understand for the first time that my body is not separate from the body of the earth and the bodies of women all over this, that we're all part of this same story and this same life body. So have you been cheered by all this Me Too activism? Well, any time anyone is breaking the silence and bringing the the, the pain and the secrets and what's been festering for it is extraordinary. So of course, it's an amazing moment. And I think what's, what's amazing about it is to see all the pockets it's influencing, you know? Um, I think having been doing this work for 20 years and working with women who've been doing this work even longer than I have and going back to, um, you know, African-American women who kind of have led these movements and, you know, from Rosa Parks to Anita Hill to, um, I think what I hope 
is that we can move from this moment we, where we are continuing to tell our stories of abuse mm -hmm. and where we're continuing to police patriarchy, whether it's building shelters or forming legal funds or building commissions, but where we really start now to look at what would it mean to dismantle racist patriarchy. Looking at it systemically, looking at it as a paradigm, because I, I just know from my own experience, if we keep parceling it out and looking at it in parts, and even in individual parts, we don't get to the bigger story. And I think in this country, because neoliberal capitalism is so genius at fragmentation, we never really want to look at the whole story. There, there's a bigger story, which is how does violence against women connect and interrelate with neoliberal capitalism, with racism, with imperialism, with war, with the destruction of the planet. There's, there's a story, and I think we really, in our movements now, have to open this story up so we look at all of the areas and how they interface with in each other. In a way, that's what you've been doing with the One Billion Rising movement, in the sense that V-Day, which we're talking, celebrating the 20 years, um, was rooted in the stories that you tell in the play Vagina Monologues and in the stories of the women who performed that play as part of that annual event and movement. But One Billion Rising, which is now in its, what, sixth, sixth year. year, has taken on a different structural question if you will, every year. Um, last year, 2017, it was women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were part of bringing thousands of women to the Department of Labor in Washington, DC, to great effect, I might say. Um, talk about that decision and, and how you see the differences. And is that a progression from V-Day to OBR? Well, I think one of the exciting things about OBR is that it's an international movement. And we have coordinators from 30 countries who gather every year to set the agenda and look at the themes. And it's really an extraordinary meeting because you have women from Africa and India and Guatemala and all over the world who have very different, but often very similar, um, struggles going on in their countries. And I think what has become progressively clear over the years that we're doing it is that if we're not looking at the issues that I said earlier of imperialism or state violence or wars, or we're not really grappling with the bigger things that are kind of around all this violence against women. And I think last year and the year before, it was very clear that marginalized women everywhere around the world had to be in front and determining what the risings were about. And that really did happen. Um, it was incredible to see Tondo, Tondo, women who lived in the slums of Tondo in the Philippines, for example, rising at the garbage sites to demand protection and freedom. Mm. Do you know? And then last year, we focused on workers and really workers leading the way. And I was really honored and privileged to be part of a coalition in this country where we worked for a year with nurses, with restaurant workers, with domestic workers, with Walmart workers. Um, teachers, really looking at, and, and a lot of these groups had never worked together before. How do we build a coalition of women worker risings, ri risers in this country where we can join our forces together? Even if we're rising for different things, what are the things that we have in common to rise for? How do you see the future playing out for this con this, this way that we think about violence? Because in a, in a sense, I can see that people's wish is we tell our personal stories and the world changes. Mm -hmm. And your own personal world might change, but everything that you talk about and we talk about on this program is that the structures that underpin the, the violence against any one of us is are what really need to change. Absolutely. And yet taking on the interconnected structures seems so overwhelming that sometimes it's hard to take that route um, yeah. if you have a choice to, to just deal with your own or? Well, I think part of it is breaking down what is racist patriarchy. And, you know, we keep leaving the big elephant in the room out of this equation, which is men, right? One man in particular, yeah, I have to say. Yes. I mean, <laughs> as I was saying to you earlier, it's like we're living in opposite worlds. You know, we had this big explosion of the Me Too movement and Time's Up and this new wave of women coming forward to tell their stories. And we have a predator in chief who is an, a person who has bragged openly about being a sexual predator and, and an assaulter and his, his and, the, and the men who are surrounding him of, are of his like, you know? So I think what would it look like to shift patriarchy? Yeah. And part of it has to be what is masculinity? 
what, what does it mean to be a man in this society? It's, it's got to change. I've always felt that patriarchy is far more destructive to men than it is to women. But there are real interests being served by the oppression of women and yes. girls. Just look at the work code. Just look at the laws around the Absolutely. world, around, around labor and, and child labor especially. So it's not like we're just all going to be able to come to this resolution and all have liberation together. There's going to have to be some shifting of power. Definitely. And, and if you look at the fact that it's a very, very, very small majority of people in the world now who have most of the, of, of the cash and most of the power. It's really a question of like, what is being done to the rest of us, whether it's sex trafficking or no jobs or exploitative labor or slave labor, to serve those 0.1%. And that's where it gets to be a bigger question because if we're not looking at a system now that is designed to serve eight people, right. <laughs> while the majority of the planet, 90% of the planet is, what is it, living on a dollar a day? Um, that's what really has to mm. shift because the, the level of poverty that women are living on in, across this planet right now is, is mind boggling. So that brings us back to creativity. and We have to imagine something that we don't see out there, which is the post-patriarchal, colonial, white, cis, capitalist world. This is what you do as a creative person. Um, help us. I mean, you, you are an imaginer of new ways of communicating. You're going to be doing it every night on the stage. What's the exercise that, that creatives like yourself, creative people like yourself, go through to stretch our creativity muscles? I know if I look around this country right now, people are shut down. People aren't feeling right now. They're traumatized. What's going on to so many different communities, whether they're immigrant communities, whether they're dreamers, whether they're, I mean, just name every day, Haitians, Guatemalans, Salvadorians. Every day, some group is being exiled and tormented. I think what we have to first do is keep our feelings alive. Mm -hmm. Do you know, we have to keep our heart alive. We have to keep that part of us that is able to fight and, and be revolutionary and be in resistance, but also be in imagination. And so any way we can create art that envisions a future, which is gonna move us towards feeling for each other and having empathy for each other, I, I think the imagination is the most powerful tool we have. Eve Ensler in the body of the world opens in February at the Manhattan Theatre Club. We'll have more information at our website. Thank you so much. Thank you. This time last year, Eve and I were happy to have had a role in introducing Jane Fonda to Saru Jayaraman. Long story, but suffice to say, not long after that, Fonda began working with the Restaurant Opportunities Center, or ROC, in their campaign to end the low tipped wages that millions of restaurant workers, disproportionately women, receive. Last summer, Jane and Lily Tomlin, her co-star in the Netflix hit Grace and Frankie, went to Detroit to canvas door to door for a ballot initiative that seeks not only to win a single fair minimum wage, but to help build a broad progressive agenda in Michigan statewide. Uh, My name is Jane Fonda. Hi. Hi. Nationally, 70% of tipped restaurant workers are women. In Michigan, it's 80%. A lot of restaurants, especially the, the wealthiest big chains, don't pay them a living wage. There's really no reason why the public should subsidize people who work for large chains. What is it called when you don't get a wage from your employer? Slavery. And actually, this is an actual legacy of slavery. So wealthy Americans who traveled to Europe and saw how the upper, 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 upper echelons did it, brought tipping back to this country, and people were outraged in America, and they said, there's no way we're going to do this, and refused to do it. And then after emancipation, they were persuaded to tip freed slaves since they were working for nothing. They had no hour, hourly salary. They, they, they would pay them in tips. So we are calling for one fair wage, if Minnesota can do it, so can Michigan. We are trying to collect 350,000 signatures to get on the ballot in November 2018. It will raise the wage to 12, and over a period of years, go from 3.38 for tipped workers to $12 an hour for everybody, tipped and non-tipped, 
with tips on top. It is such a dream come true to have Jane and, and Lily with us here. I grew, I grew up here, absolutely. And you were a waitress. Wait, wait, wait. I was a waitress <laughs> many times. You worked in a hospital once, right? I did. I worked, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I worked as a, <laughs> I worked as a tray girl. I de Brought delivered trays to patients. I delivered the trays to the patients, and uh, and I would be beside myself trying to uh, make sure that the, uh, the 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 hospital workers went and fed the patients because so many of them just lie there fairly motionless and of course nobody did they'd be hiding in the broom closet having a smoke <laughs> <laughs> the sexual harassment in the in the restaurant industry is rampant uh, the, the w restaurant workers are like seven percent of the American population and they 36 or 37 percent of sexual harassment uh, cases are brought from the restaurant industry this is for your beautiful rack It's really the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby that has, for now over a hundred years, held sway over Congress, hold, held sway over state legislature, held sway over all elected officials, Democrats and Republicans. They've just bought and sold uh, our legislators and spread this incredible mythology that this can't be done. Workers can't be paid well. Women can't be treated well. It's just impossible. And we know it not to be true. Seven states have shown it is possible, including Minnesota next door. So there's no reason Michigan can't do it. So that if those things happen, which they shouldn't, you still can take home some money, which uh, we should do as a This has become way more urgent in the last few weeks. President Trump's Department of Labor has announced that they are going to change 80 years of law and put out a federal regulation that if any restaurant pays the full minimum wage, the employer can wholly steal legally the workers' tips. And so um, our ballot measure would not only call for one fair wage, it would also say in Michigan, tips are absolutely the property of workers. There's a lot of resistance going on and has been since last November, and that's fantastic. But we have to go beyond no to the yes. What is the yes? that will beckon us forward to a future that we can all share and embrace. And we have to learn to leave, leave aside our differences and come together for a yes. And this is a long-term effort, way beyond midterms, to try to break down the silos that exist, to try to bring people together, whether no matter what party they belong to, no, ma no matter who they voted for, um, across race and gender and age, etc., to say, what kind of a state do we want? Um, we are moving a ballot measure for one fair wage, which in and of itself is groundbreaking. You know, uh, this would be the first large state to, after many, many years, to join the seven states in eliminating the lower wage for tipped workers. But because it is such an important state after November, it's really exciting that we're using this process to actually build power for people in the state and listen to them because, you know, we do these ballot measures, which right now in this state of the world is the only way we can actually move progressive change because legislatures have been completely taken over. We move these ballot measures, we spend millions of dollars on them, we talk to hundreds of thousands of people, and then all of those contacts are just lost. And so the idea of using this process to actually engage hundreds of thousands of people in this parallel process called We the People is really exciting and means that Everything we're investing in this campaign is going to produce double the amount of money we're investing in it. You know, it's going to produce an amazing change for the state of Michigan and for the nation in terms of uh, raising the wage and eliminating the lower wage for tip workers. And it's going to create this incredible positive uh, experience that we can replicate in a lot of other states. We want the people to be empowered to foster it for themselves and they've got to have the, the dignity and, and support of having a decent job and earning decent wages, and that's what we're certainly hoping for. Wouldn't it be great if every single person that owns a business understands what it means to earn a fair wage and not have to suffer like that? I mean, that's the kind of world we want. So this broad coalition that brings together 
across races, across class, people into this We the People uh, campaign to create a people's platform that we will ask everyone to support. And, you know, if people running for office don't support it, then we don't support them. Grace and Frankie is kicking off its fourth season on Netflix right now. To find out more about Rock's campaign and see Fonda and Tomlin playing waitresses dealing with sexist customers in videos they made for ATTN, go to our website and sign up to become a supporter subscriber. And thanks.